found myself sitting on a couch in our living room with blood running down my face from a gash in my forehead, and I was 12 years old, and my dad looked at me and he said, son, there's a fine line between courage and stupid. It's a weird place to say amen, but I'm glad you're connected. (laughs) I had just made a go-kart out of plywood and two-by-fours and connected trucks from my skateboard and had ridden it down a giant hill and tried to go off a four-foot ramp, and it didn't go so well. A couple years later, my brothers and I decided to make bottle rocket cannons out of PVC pipes so we could shoot them at each other. We were in our backyard at 2 o'clock in the morning, waging war, shooting bottle rockets at each other across the backyard, and my brother aimed at me, and he shot the bottle rocket, and it curved and hit the side of our house and stuck into our house and blew up. So... We got my dad out of bed, and he said, son, there's a fine line between courage and stupid. If you're going to be dumb, you got to be tough. What is courage? I don't consider myself a very courageous person. I do consider myself a pretty stupid person sometimes, because that line is so thin, isn't it? Because courage is standing up against an obstacle and saying, what stands behind me is bigger than the obstacle, right? And stupid is saying, there's an obstacle, let's try to smash it. And sometimes you don't even think about whether or not what's behind you is bigger than what's in front of you. William Hoff was called the Iceman because he attempted to scale Mount Everest wearing only shorts. There's a fine line between courage and stupid. Two years later, he scaled Mount Kilimanjaro in just two days. He held 18 world records and he did it only wearing a pair of swim trunks. He immersed himself in ice for an hour and 13 minutes and 48 seconds without dying. He's stupid. Martin Strell, in 2007, swam over 66 days, 3,300 miles down the Amazon River. In this 66-day challenge, he said the following, I was attacked by piranhas a few times, at one point eating my back. His team's remedy was to follow behind him in a boat and pour buckets of blood in the water to attract the piranhas away from him. There's a fine line between courage and just being stupid, right? Nick Walenda became the first person to tightrope walk across Niagara Falls in 2012. 165 feet below him was the water. It took him 40 minutes, six world records, and he did it. However, Kirk Jones wasn't so lucky. Bravery says, I'm a trained acrobat with a giant balance beam who's walked, you know, the, or giant balance bar, who's walked tight ropes for forever. I've practiced and practiced and practiced. I'm going to attempt Niagara Falls. Kirk Jones decided that he was going to try to go over Niagara Falls in a giant inflatable ball. (laughs) Holding on to his pet boa constrictor named Misty. (laughs) They didn't make it. In 2018, rapper John James decided he was going to try something nobody's ever tried before, and that is make a music video while walking on the wing of an airplane. However, in the attempt, 
He walked out too far. The pilot lost control. He fell off. His chute didn't open, and he died. Because there's a fine line between bravery and stupidity. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 11 if you have it. Hebrews chapter 11. What motivates people to do things? Fame? What motivates you to swim 66 or 3,300 miles in 66 days down the Amazon River with piranhas attacking your back? What motivates that? Pride? Money? Notoriety? To say that you've done it? Courage always has a motivation. What motivates somebody to step into an MMA ring and try to win? That would terrify me. You have somebody who's looking at you and their only thought is, I want to kill you. And you're going to do that voluntarily? Courage would say, I have the training to back this up and I am courageously, bravely stepping into the ring to defend my honor, my pride, or earn money, or whatever it is. If you're Conor McGregor, it's because you're stupid. What is it that will give you the courage to stand for Christ today? You're about to walk out of this building here in a few minutes, and you're going to go back to normal life, right? Right? Because this is a lot of fun. This is cool to get together and to talk about these biblical concepts and to talk about bravery and to talk about identity and to talk about how we should approach this from a biblical perspective. But the problem is, you're going to go back to your school on Monday and life's going to go back to normal. And so the question is, what is it that's going to give you the courage to do what's right? What is it that's going to give you the bravery to stand up for the truth of Scripture, and to act in accordance with God's Word? That's the question we have to ask. And the answer is faith. You could say it this way. The only way that you will live for God in the 21st century is if you have genuine, life-transforming faith in Jesus Christ. Anything else will fall apart. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to put the text on the screen behind me. I didn't bring that. Oh, I got my clicker right here. Hang on. Okay. I'm going to read it. You follow along on the screen. Hebrews chapter 11, begin reading in verse 23. Follow along with me as I read. By faith, Moses, when he was born was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. That's Pharaoh. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, that's talking about the Exodus, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer might not touch them. The the faith that's put on display for us in Hebrews chapter 11 is the same faith that you must possess in your life in order to stand for Christ today. You know what's sad is I've spent a lot of my life preaching to teenagers. and, And what's sad is that, that's not sad, that's actually pretty cool. But what's sad is that the teenagers that I've seen come through our ministry here at Community, the ministry of a, of a conference center and a camp that I had the opportunity of ministering at for over six years with thousands of teenagers coming through, is that teens think that just because they're in the right group, 
or if they can just get through youth group and get through school and get out, they're going to be okay. And many of them, quote unquote, walk away from the faith because it's a faith that they never possessed. It's they come to a conference like this and they're sitting with their youth group and they'll say, oh yeah, that's great. And oh, that was a good session. And here's my takeaway and here's what's going on. But then they walk away or they go back into their public school environment or they leave and go to a public college and they walk away from God. Because this faith is not present in their life. What I want to do is I want to trace for you the four aspects of faith that we see in this passage. We're going to go section by section. I'll give you a hint. It's real easy. Each section starts with by faith. And we're going to ask the question, what kind of faith is demonstrated here? And how can that faith be demonstrated in your life? So look with me down at verse 23 and let's see the first aspect. And that is this genuine faith preserves Life. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. What is this referencing? It's referencing Exodus chapter 2 when the children of Israel are in Egypt and Pharaoh says, Listen, these people are getting way too powerful. They kind of scare me because, you know, because they're growing even bigger than, than, than we are and they're unified together around their gods. We're going to limit the number of Jews that are in Egypt and we're going to do that by killing all the guys that are born. And so he gives a decree, any male child that's born must be killed. And this verse says, there was at least one couple, we know according to the book of Exodus chapter 1, that there were many more, who said, I don't care what you say, God says, the faith that I have is preserved, and God says that life is sacred. That's the first thing they recognized. Sanctity of life. They made a very specific choice to value human life as sacred, made in the image of God. Christopher said earlier, very aptly, that there's a difference between may, being made in the image of God and being a child of God. There's a big difference. You're here. You're made in the image of God. But only those who repent of their sins and embrace Jesus for salvation in Christ alone by faith are made children of God. But all people are made in the image of God and therefore life is sacred. There's something in you that knows that human life is different from animal life. In May of 2019, Washington state became the first U.S. state to legalize what's called human composting. This means that if you live in the state of Washington, you now have the option... Rather than being buried or being cremated or being embalmed, you can be turned into soil. Isn't that nice? Here's what Katrina Spade, who worked to develop this process, says. Recomposition offers an alternative to embalming and burial and cremation that is natural, safe, and sustainable and will result in significant savings of carbon emissions and land usage. So instead of being buried, how about we just turn you into a nice flower pot? And then we can put you out front and plant flowers in you. And so when people come, you can say, hey, let me introduce you to my grandmother. She's right here. She's the soil. She's the dirt. Or better yet, let's grow something from it like a tomato plant. And then when we have a tomato sandwich, we can say, these came from grandma. Now, why, why is that even funny? It's funny because there's something in you that says, okay, you just crossed a line. It's one thing to take dead plants and maybe even dead animals and compost them and turn them into fertilizer or whatever. It's something totally different to do that to people. Why? Because there's something different about people. I love to deer hunt. Deer hunting season starts for, teen, for youth 
Um, next Saturday here in Indiana, so I'm going to take my 10-year-old out, and she's got her new little deer rifle, and we're going to try to kill an animal. And what we've been doing is we've been setting what's called game cameras up. You know what game cameras are? Game cameras are these little cameras that are camouflaged you put on the tree, and when an animal walks by it, it takes pictures. And I get some really cool pictures of coyotes and, and all sorts of stuff, right? And then you, you determine what time that, pers- that, that person, that deer is coming by and you say, okay, they come by about every evening, about between 5.30 and 7, so I'm going to set my stand and I'm going to plan to be in the stand early so that I'm not disturbing anything and my scent goes away. And then when they come by, I'm going to take my gun and I'm going to shoot them and then I'm going to bring them home and I'm going to cut them up and eat them, right? And that's what, how many of you love deer? How many of you are animal lovers and you say, I can't imagine killing anything? Let me see your hands. I know, it's okay. I like, I love animals. They taste very good. And, and we, you know, but God gave us dominion and it's a blessing to exercise that dominion for full organic meat. Anyway, but, um, but if you were to take that same process of deer hunting that I was just talking to Chuck about and, and that he does in Michigan, you take that same process and you apply that to humans And everything changes and you go, that's dark. If you do that exact same thing with a person, why? Because there is something sacred about human life. It's different. It's made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. You're not an animal. You didn't evolve from monkeys. God created you to be exactly who you are. He owns you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You don't own your body. God created you. He created you in His image. And because of that, you are sacred. That means that you have value. Self-esteem says... I am such a good person. And the Bible says, actually, you're not. Self-worth says, I have great value. And that's why you protect your body. As we've been even talking about the the sanctity of sexuality. It's because you have worth and value because you're made in the image of God. Just like a $20 bill is worth $20, or used to be, is worth $20 because the government says that's what it's worth. And it's just a piece of cotton. So God says you are worth so much. Because you're made in his image. Moses' parents recognize that. Nobody owns life but God. Nobody can decree the end of human life. And to decree the beginning of human life but God. You can't create life. Humans can create robots that look a lot like a person. But there's nothing that we can build and then breathe life into it. It's impossible. Science, no matter what happens, they say, we've created life in a laboratory. No, you didn't. You just used God's means and created cells that duplicate. You didn't create life. You can't create life. Only God can do that. You can't just breathe life into something. And listen to me. If you can't create life, that means you shouldn't take life. You realize in here that your life's not your own. You can't give something that's not yours. Like what would happen if I came down and I took something that you owned and then I went and I gave it to somebody else for a gift? You'd be like, whoa, 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 Joe, hang on a second. Time out. That's not yours. And if it's not yours, you can't give it. I can give it because it's mine because I own it. But that's not yours, Joe. You can't give that to him. And let me tell you something, guys. You realize that you can't give up your life. There's not one person in here who can close your eyes right now and die. None of you can do it. You can't give up your life because it's not yours. And you know that because some of you have tried. Now, you can take your life. You can steal it. The implications on this on suicide are huge. God determines when you live. God determines when you die. Your life is sacred and faith recognizes that faith says there's something different about life in humans than life in anything else
Not only that, but Moses' parents recognized and understood the authority of God. Verse 23, they saw the child was beautiful. They were not afraid of the king's edict. Why? Because they recognized God's authority as being supreme. They recognize there may be times when an authority asks you or requires you to do something that goes against God's standards. I'm not talking about preferences. I'm not talking about taxes. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about an authority looking at you and telling you to do something or requiring something of you that God's word says no. Or they say no when God's word says you must. I talked to a Chinese missionary who was giving this testimony. You know, there's not a lot of focus on persecution around the world. I've done a lot of traveling in different countries, and I could tell you stories of persecution that's happened in the last several years. I was talking to a Chinese missionary who said that he and his missionary friend were witnessing. They were preaching as part of a house church, sharing the truth of the gospel. They were arrested by the Chinese government, and they were taken to the top of a building. And this man giving me this testimony said, they took my friend and they put his eyes out with a pair of scissors and they walked him off the edge of the building and he fell and died. Then they looked at me and they said, if you don't stop preaching, if you don't stop witnessing, we're going to do the same to you. And they let him go free. So what did he do? He went home. He sent out a note to his church and he said, we need to get together for a prayer meeting tonight because we need courage. We need boldness. Friends, that's what's happening in this passage, is that those who didn't obey the king were put to death. We aren't faced with that kind of thing in America today, but did you know what happens all over the world? I was in India, and and we're traveling to India, and the week before we got there, north of where we were going, The radical Hindus had attacked the Christians and they had drugged them out in the streets and they had killed them in the streets and left their bodies as a sign to say that if you side with Jesus, this is what's going to happen to you. Friends, if that were to happen in America today, how many people wouldn't show up to church on Sunday? I mean, all we need is a little virus and people don't come to church anymore. Can you imagine... If someone were to take Christians and to put them in the middle of every city and to kill them and say, if you worship God, this is going to be you. What kind of courage does it take to stand for Christ? Friends, that's happening, guys. That's not, you don't hear about it because our news doesn't report on things like that. But I've talked to people face to face who say, this is what's happening. The guy that I talked to had a lady in his church dragged, this is a true story, dragged out in the street. She was pregnant. They killed her. They cut her open, took the baby out, laid it next to her, put a sign on her that said, Christians die. This is the kind of stuff that's happening today. And here we are in America, and we sit around, and you say, Joe, it's really dark. Yeah, I know, but that's, that's happening. This is real. And we sit around, and we say, you know what? I'd rather sit in my PJs and drink my cup of coffee and watch church online, which isn't church, because church means gathering, so if you don't gather, you aren't going to church. Little side note. Because I don't feel like it today. I don't want people to know where I stand on pro-life issues. I don't want people to know where I stand in Christianity because they'll make fun of me at school. What kind of courage does it take? It takes a courage that's anchored in your faith. Over and over again in Exodus 1 and 2, we see a, a common theme. I'll read you some of the phrases. The midwives feared God And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. They counted what God said as more important than the sin they were asked to do. You don't have anybody asking you and making you. You don't have anybody making you sin. What would happen if we had a generation of teenagers today who feared God? who are willing to stand up and say, I love you, but this is what God 
has said in his world, his word. Faith. Number two, verse 24. Faith rejects worldly status. Look on the screen with me. Look in your Bibles if you have them. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses stayed with his Hebrew family. Remember the story? Moses was put in the basket in the Nile River, and he floats down the Nile River, and he comes and he, he bumps up against the, the, the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter says, oh, it's a baby, you know, and she picks it up, and she says, oh, the baby's so awesome, and then Moses' sister's walking down, checking on him, and Miriam says, hey, I know a lady who'd love to nurse that baby, by the way, it's his mom, and, uh, and she'd love to nurse that baby and take care of him, and so they take Moses out of the water, which is what the word Moses mean, it means drawn out of the water, cool little Bible fact, Moses is drawn out of the Nile, he's taken to his mom, and he lives with his mom for probably about 10 years. And they train him up in the ways of the Lord. And they train him up in the knowledge of Yahweh. And sometime when he is a child, he embraces genuine faith. And the whole point of this passage is that it's not what Moses did that saved him. It's what he believed. And then at 10 or 12 years old, Moses is entered back into the house of Pharaoh. And he's given power. He's given prestige. He's given everything. The most powerful home at that point in the world. What does it say that he did? After being exposed to this sin, these treasures, this prestige, this status, it says that he refused worldly prestige. He refused the worldly status. He valued faith, suffering more than fleeting pleasure. You know what's interesting is Moses recognized that there's this dichotomy in life. Here it is, you ready? Either you have your fleeting pleasure now and you pay for it for all of eternity, or you have fleeting suffering now and you have joy for all of eternity. That's what it says that, that he counted it as more value. That there are pleasures now that will, that will fl- run away from you. You know, there's this, uh, in, in that video, and the guy saw it in regards to pornography, but there's a cycle to where when you view pornography, it releases dopamine in your mind, and it becomes a drug, and it, it enslaves you, and it addicts you. But the problem is, is that every time you view pornography, you need more and more and more and more and more. And it never satisfies. It only destroys you. It's a fleeting pleasure that's gone after a period of minutes. And yet Moses said, I'm willing to deny those fleeting pleasures of sin in order to embrace faith in God. In order to embrace what truly satisfies. Suffering on this earth lasts for a season. But joy and heaven lasts forever. Listen to the way Peter puts it in 1 Peter. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen to the way James says it. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, that's eternal life, which God has promised to those who love him. Here's what both Peter and James are saying, and you see it woven through the entire scripture. Those who persevere under trials show genuine faith. They show that they're truly saved. Right after we got married, my wife bought me a Rolex watch. You know what a Rolex watch is? How many of you know what a Rolex watch is? You see your hands. Okay. She bought me a Rolex date just 36 millimeter stainless steel. And I wore it for a couple years. And the, the, you could get one now for about $6,500. It's a what? About $6,000. Um, but there's one problem. And that is that it was fake. <laughs> in fact, she bought it in China for 15 bucks. But when I wore it, nobody knew that. So I used to wear it, and uh, I actually walked into, I had, I had a, like a discipling opportunity with somebody, and I walked, this is not it, by the way, this is just cheap watch, but I walked in to this, um, to this IHOP restaurant, and 
and somebody stopped me as I'm walking back to my booth, and they grabbed me by the arm, and they said, whoa, nice watch. And I'm like, <laughs> thanks, man. Appreciate it. I love it. My wife got it for me. Like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't tell them it was fake, right? Because you can't tell. So I took it to a Rolex dealer to get the watch sized because I thought that would be really funny to see what happens. So we're in Greenville, South Carolina. I walk up. There's a Rolex dealer there. I walk in with my watch, and I said, you know, the bracelet's a little bit too big for me. Do you mind sizing it down a little bit? Sure. No problem. You know, we'll get that done for you. I took my watch off. I gave it to him. He goes in the back room. About five minutes later, he comes out, and his face was just, I mean, you could see he was just terrified because he thought he was going to tell me something that I didn't know. And that is that I spent thousands of dollars on a watch that was actually fake. And he comes out and he says, "Um, sir, uh, I am so sorry to tell you this. But this watch is not genuine. Like, I know my wife got it for me in China. It's okay. It was only 15 bucks, you know. He's like, oh. I, I, was, I thought you thought it was James. Like, no, no, I, I knew it was a fake. But the problem was that everyone that looked at it didn't know that. And the only way that you could tell was to examine it closely. And to take the back off. And a watch expert would look at this and say, I know it looks real, but it's not. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that at the last day, Jesus is going to say to many... Depart from me, I never knew you. You're not genuine. And they'll say, Lord, Lord, you don't understand. We cast out demons in your name. And and we went everywhere we could in your name. And we served you. And we did so many good works. And I went to youth group every day. And I I was in church. and, And I said the right things. And I tried to live the best I could. And Jesus says, Depart from me, you workers iniquity not genuine and what scripture is trying to tell you is that one day guys listen up there will be trials that come in your life and the way you respond to those trials will reveal the genuineness of your faith you won't lose your salvation that's impossible but they will reveal whether or not your faith is genuine. That's what the parable of the soils is all about. Turn, to, turn back to Mark chapter 4. This is a, a really fascinating passage. Mark chapter 4. We'll go through this real briefly. I won't, obviously won't preach a whole message on it. But if you remember the, the parable of the soils where, where Jesus tells the parable that he cast the seed and some fell on rocky ground and some fell on thorny ground and some fell on stony ground and some fell on good ground, right? Well, he interprets it in verse 13. The one that fell on the stony ground, Satan immediately comes and takes it away. Those people are not saved. Mark 4, 17. But then then it falls on stony ground. And and it seems like it's, it's growing up. It seems like there's fruit. But then there's no root. And they endure for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, immediately they fall away. It's a scandal is what Mark is saying. That's literally what that Greek word means. It's a scandalous faith. And the thorny ground, the seed is planted and it springs up and it looks like there's fruit growing. And then the cares of the world grow up. And and you have these, you know, you've got the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And you have all the materialism of the world grows up and it chokes out that faith. And the whole point is to say there are those who have non-genuine faith. And the only way that you tell is when it's tested. The only way you could tell the watch was a fake is if you test it. Hebrews chapter 11, faith is being tested. Moses here rejects worldly prestige and he values Christ more than all the wealth in Egypt. Look at what that verse says. It's really fascinating here. It says, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward, looking to the reward. So a couple questions here. What does the word reproach mean? It's not really a word we use today. It simply means to be made fun of. 
ridicule. Can you imagine being the only Jew in an Egyptian house adopted and people making fun of you because the way you talk and the way you look and your upbringing and your faith? And Moses said that he chose to value that more than the wealth in Egypt. Why? Well, the question is this. What is it about Jesus that's so valuable? If you had a million dollars and you drove a Maserati to school every day, and you drove up and you rev it every day, vroom, you know, we were, I was in Hollywood, uh, California in January, and we saw three or four Lamborghinis come down the stretch and just loud as ever, wom, wom, wom. What would happen if you went to school and people started making fun of you for driving a sports car at 16 years old? Dude, you're so dumb. I can't believe you drive a $500,000 car at 16. You're so stupid. You'd be like, what? Would you drive a bike? Or were those roller skates? Why? Because what you have is more valuable than what they have. So what is it about Jesus that's so valuable that Moses was willing to be ridiculed and made fun of and reproached for the name of Christ? What is it about Jesus that's so valuable? Ready for this? Two things. Number one. Jesus is the only source of lasting satisfaction and joy. You had it pictured for you in the life of Christopher. He had everything and he hit rock bottom and it's all gone. He's the only source of lasting satisfaction and joy. But number two, more importantly, Paul tells us this in Philippians. Jesus is the only pursuit that you will get more of when you die. You spend your life making money and saving it. And you know what happens when you die? Someone else takes it. And statistics say in five years, it's gone. You spend your life building up this prestige to be the, the best person at this or the best person at this. And you know what happens when you die? It's over. You spend your life collecting things. And when you die, you know what happens? Somebody else throws them away. You don't see any U-Hauls behind a hearse. I do a lot of funerals. And I've never seen a U-Haul in a funeral. The hearse and all the guy's stuff because it's going with him. It's not the way it works. There's only one thing in your life that when you die, you'll get more of. And that's Jesus Christ. You pursue him now. You invest now. You love him. You serve him. And when you die, you get more of him. And here's the way Paul says it. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is what? Gain what? Gain Christ. For if to me to live is Christ, then to die is gain. If for me to live is baseball and to die is to lose baseball. For me to live is hunting and to die is to lose hunting. For me to live is video games, then I'm stupid. For me to live is money, then to die is I lose money. You know, and we could go on and on and on and on and on. The only thing you will gain more of when you die is Jesus. That's why. He is the most valuable thing you could ever pursue. The most valuable pursuit in your life. He looked to that reward. What is your hope in? What are you looking towards? Number three, faith obeys even when it's hard. Look at verse 27. By faith, Moses left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. God says, Moses, I want you to go get those children out of, Israel, out of Egypt. Moses says, not this Moses. Maybe you got me confused with the other Moses. Because I can't talk well. I'm not a good, argue, I'm not a good orator. I, I'm like weak. God says, I know, but that's why I'm going to show my glory through you. I want you to go get him out of Egypt. Moses says, well, well, who am I going to tell him sent me? Tell him that Yahweh sent you. Well, what if they don't believe me? Well, your staff's going to turn into a snake. And God takes out all of his excuses. And in the end, Moses' faith perseveres and he obeys God. 
And it said that he was not afraid of Pharaoh. You know, fear is a powerful motivator. How many of you are afraid of spiders? Let me see your hands. I mean, like, how many of you hate spiders? Like, even when I'm saying it, you're getting these tickly things going down the back of your neck like spiders are awful. I was on a mission trip to the jungles of South America in Guyana, and they have these gigantic tarantulas that eat birds. Birds. Okay. Now, let's imagine for a minute that there's this mom, and she's scared to death of spiders. And she's like, if I even see an ant and I think it's a spider, I start screaming, right? Oh, you know, come kill it for me, all this kind of stuff, right? And then she sees like a black widow and she has, and she faints. She's scared to death of spiders, right? Now, she won't go near a spider. She won't touch it. If it's in the room, she closes the door, wait till the husband gets home to get a newspaper and he walks in. It's one of those teeny, teeny, tiny jumping spiders that nobody cares about and she's freaking out, all right? Let's say, for instance, that mom and her precious little baby are in the living room and she's got the baby, I don't know, playing on the floor for tummy time or whatever. There's tummy time Tim on the floor over there. And mom's reading Magnolia Magazine with Joanna Gaines because I don't know why, but that's what ladies do. And so there's, time, there's Tammy in tummy time and here's mom reading Joanna Gaines. And all of a sudden she sees this black object crawling towards her baby. And she looks, and sure enough, since we're in Indiana, she sees, it's not a brown, black object, it's a brown object, and it's a brown recluse spider, and it's crawling towards her child. Now, in that moment, this scared of spiders, I don't want to touch spiders, they freak me out, mom turns into super ninja warrior spider slayer right? And she rolls up that prized magazine that she bought for 30 bucks at Target and she jumps off her chair and she smashes it and over and over and over again. And she's like, <laughs> you know, adrenaline Hulk mom comes out and she smashes a spider. Why? What's the difference? What's the difference? What's the difference? Okay, she's got to protect something. Do you know what conquered her fear of spiders? Yes, but something brought the adrenaline in her system. Thank you, Mr. Biology. <laughs> Do you know what conquered that fear? Listen very carefully. Listen up like this way. What conquered that fear was a greater fear. And that greater fear was that her baby was going to get bit by that spider. And listen to me very closely, guys. Until you fear God more than you fear your friends, you will never stand up for him. Because the only thing that conquers fear is a greater fear. And you must fear God. It's all through this passage. The, the midwives didn't fear the king. They feared God. The midwives didn't fear the king. They feared God. Right here in verse 27. He left Egypt. He was not afraid of the anger of the king. Why? Because he was scared to death of God. Did I hear you right? Yeah, he was feared. He feared God. God told him to do something. And he had a righteous fear that if he didn't obey God, that he was going to be the object of God's wrath. He feared God. And because he feared God, he had a respect and a rightful fear of who God was. He chose to obey. And the king's like, well, I'll kill you. He's like, I'd rather deal with you than deal with God. Let me tell you something, guys. There's this concept out there today, and Christopher talked about it a little bit in, the, in identifying God's love correctly. There's this concept out there today that God is this old man in the sky who's like a giant marshmallow 
and he's just lovey-dovey, and we're just going to worship him, and, and there's, no, there's not really any depth to God, and he's like my best buddy, and he does stick closer than a brother, but let me tell you something, guys. God is full of wrath towards sin, and in love, I want to tell you that if you're here and you have not repented of your sins and turned to Christ, you are the object of God's wrath. And God will pour out his wrath on you when you die in hell for all of eternity. You realize Satan doesn't run hell, right? Who runs hell? Who runs hell? God does. It's the presence of God that makes hell so terrible. Satan is punished in hell. Satan's not the king of hell. God is pouring out his wrath on sin. He's pouring out his wrath on those who choose to side with sin. So when Jesus saves you, what does he save you from? He saves you from the wrath of God. He saves you from the power of God. He saves you from the wrath of God poured out on your life because Jesus took that wrath for you. On the cross, Jesus received the wrath of God and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was forsaken so that you don't have to be. It was God's wrath poured out on him. And there should be a holy fear of God. And if you're a believer, there should be a heart of worship that says, God, I can't believe that you loved me enough. To that in heaven now, rather than having a judge I have a father and that he has accepted me into his family so that I am no longer an object of God's wrath. Fear. Why does God hate sin? Because it destroys what he loves. You know that mom that hates spiders so much that she's willing to destroy it in order to save her baby? That's why God hates sin because it destroys you. He has to hate sin. It's the opposite of who he is. And his wrath is poured out on sin. The only thing that conquers fear is a greater fear. Lastly, and most importantly, look at verse 28. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Remember the Passover? The last plague in Egypt was that an angel sent from God would take the life of every firstborn in Egypt unless the blood was spread over the doorposts. And those who were found under the blood of the doorposts were safe from God's wrath. And God said, this is what you need to do. You need to put the blood over you because if you don't, you're going to die. And Moses said, in obedience to God, in obedience to God, I'm going to keep that Passover. There's something very important in this passage that we have to understand. By faith, Moses kept. He protected. He obeyed. He fulfilled what God required. And he put his faith in what? The blood. Let me explain the gospel to you. Here's the gospel. You have a problem that you can't solve. No matter what you do, you can never fix your problem. The speed limit was 35. You've been caught going 75. And the, the, the police officer says, listen, I have to give you a ticket. And you say, no, 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 you don't understand. For the next 10 miles, I'm going to go 10 miles an hour to make up for the fact that I was going that much over. And so when I go under the speed limit, it's going to help me for going over the speed limit. And so you don't have to give me a ticket. And the police officer says, you're stupid <laughs> because that's not the way this works. And yet somehow you think that you can do good works to make up for the fact that you've broken God's law. It doesn't make any sense. Because it's not that you're not very bad, it's that you've broken God's law at all. And since you've broken God's law, you're guilty. And because you're guilty, you have to be condemned to hell for all of eternity because the wages of sin is death. And every single person has broken God's law. You don't believe me? Ten Commandments. 
Is God always first place in your life? You've broken number one. Number two, idols. Probably got that taken care of, except there's probably something in your life that you can see that you put more value in than the invisible God. So actually, you've broken that one as well. You ever use God's name without talking to him or about him? Then you've broken the third commandment. Have you kept the Sabbath as holy? Have you always honored your father and your mother? Murder! Ha! Ah! I'm not a murderer! But Jesus says, listen, if you've looked at somebody with hatred, you've murdered them in your heart, you are a murderer. Adultery! No, if you've looked at somebody with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. We haven't even gotten to lying. Stealing. Coveting. Maybe you're a whole lot worse than you thought you were. And God says, because that's true, you can't have access to him. But... He loved you enough to demonstrate his love for you. And he sent his son to not only not do everything wrong, but to do everything right. He fulfilled the law, never broke it, and then he took your sin on himself so that when you have faith in him as your substitute, you could gain access to heaven. It has nothing to do with what you do. It has everything to do with who you trust. But listen to me carefully, guys. Faith doesn't save. Did you know that? Salvation is not by faith alone. Salvation is by faith in Christ alone. You see, it's not about the amount of faith you have. It's about the object of your faith. Faith in Christ to save you. Have you trusted Christ? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? Is he your only source of hope, your only source of joy? Faith in Christ alone. He's your substitute. He's the only one who can save you. Moses kept the Passover and trusted in the blood on the doorpost to cover him from the wrath of God. And the only way that you're going to stand for truth in today's culture is if you do the same. To place yourself under the blood of Jesus Christ and say, I can't do anything good enough to earn God's favor. I trust in him and him alone for my salvation. If you haven't do that, if you haven't never done that, I would encourage you to talk to your youth pastor or your youth sponsor before you leave today. Faith will persevere. That's what scripture says. The tested genuineness. It's very simple. Trials will test your faith and they will reveal whether or not you're a genuine Christian. I can't trust for you. I wish I could. If I could, I would. You have to reach out, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus alone as your rescuer, and find salvation. Stand for Christ in today's culture. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. I pray that you would give us wisdom as we seek to align our hearts with what you have said in your word. That faith defied decree that was against your truth, that faith rejected the world's prestige, that faith obeyed even in the face of hardship and suffering, and that faith trusted the blood and the blood alone to protect from the wrath of God. I pray that that faith is present in the hearts of these teenagers. And if it's not, Father, I pray that you would give them that faith, that they would place their faith and trust in you alone for salvation, that they would turn from their sin and turn to you and find saving faith in Christ. Thank you for the wonderful day we've had. I pray that it would not be lost on anyone's heart, but that we would remember what we've taken away. In your precious name we pray.